So hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Celine, and I'm a co-chair of the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Advisory Group. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our second EORE Hour event. Today's event is organized by the Minds Advisory Group on lessons learned from the Digital Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Project in Iraq, Lebanon, Somalia, and Vietnam. As the past two years have demonstrated, the capacity of our sector to remotely disseminate EORE messages that encourages safer behavior has only become increasingly important. As a sector, we have so much to explore in this area as we continue to strive to be as efficient and effective as possible. And in this vein, I'm personally really excited to learn from MAG's project. This webinar is also complementary to an upcoming digital EORE workshop hosted by JSHD and UNICEF next month to reinforce the quality coverage and equity of EORE programming through the use of appropriate digital tools and methods. So thank you to these organizations for highlighting the importance of digital EORE and special thanks today to our colleagues at MAG for taking the initiative to organize this webinar. So without wanting to take further time for the main event, I'm now gonna pass over the mic to MAG for the presentation. Good luck. Okay, everybody. My name is Robin Toll. I'm the Digital EORE Coordinator at MAG and I'll be joined uh, in this presentation by Christina Hendricks who is the ME coordinator for the project, and we'll talk about that specifically. Um, so before we get started, uh, we're trying to keep this a, a little bit kind of participatory and, and find out more about your uh, perspectives on digital ERE. Um, so you should see a poll pop up uh, for you in just a moment. Uh, we're interested uh, if you're planning on uh, including any digital EOR activities uh, in the future. So I'll just give a, a few seconds for some people to fill in that. Okay, I'm gonna continue onwards. Okay, so just a few kind of basics, uh, just to kind of uh, give the foundations of what we're discussing today. Uh, how MAG um, is defining digital ERE. Uh, what we're doing is seeking to adapt traditional face-to-face -face risk education approaches uh, to leverage digital communities, platforms, and tools in order to maximize uh, impact and behavior change. So why do we want to consider digital EORE now? Uh, effectively, the, the world has changed significantly in the last 20 years, particularly in the, the realms of communication. Uh, back in the year 2000, there were a few hundred people using the internet, a few hundred million people using the internet, nearly five billion as of today. Uh, and you see a similar story with social media and mobile phones. Social media uh, back in the year 2000 effectively didn't really exist. Uh, today, uh, across all kinds of platforms, there are nearly 3.6 billion. Uh, and then mobile phone use is one of the, the most quickly uh, adopted technologies in the history of the world. We've gone from 268 million in 2007 to 5.3 billion today. And therefore that's created lots of new opportunities uh, for us to engage with communities about these type of issues. So some of the issues uh, or challenges or barriers that we've identified that digital ERE can potentially overcome. Um, just financial constraints in terms of cost, uh, Generally, the digital approach is cheaper. You're not having to recruit and deploy uh, numbers of staff. Um, the production is quite a bit cheaper and the distribution, the delivery of the materials itself can be relatively cost effective. Um, culture can be a challenge in some places, uh, whether you're from the right background or ethnicity or clan. Uh, we kind of remove that aspect by de delivering things digitally. You don't have an individual that you're using as a conduit. Uh, security is a major one if we're not able to access uh, certain areas because of um, the threat from war and conflict, uh, then, then digital is a way that enabling us to kind of leapfrog over that and get information out to people, even when we can't put people on the ground. Um, as kind of alluded to the cost one, that the development uh, of materials has become much more accessible and with it more uh, cost-effective. 
than it used to be and no longer require an external designer and specialist skills and equipment. You can do a lot of this stuff um, yourselves. Everything you will see today, we've developed in-house at MAG. Uh, and then the deployment as well, um, you know, rather than having to get people out into the field, uh, you know, we can do this pretty rapidly. And I'll talk about an example of uh, some emergency remote digital risk education a little bit further on. In some countries, weather can be a problem, um, or it's monsoon or other kind of challenges. Um, digital leapfrogs that and you can still get your materials out in front of people regardless of what the weather situation is. Uh, we know at MAG that some groups are harder to engage than others um, and it's difficult to get them to attend sessions um, and therefore by basically pushing our information to them rather than trying to pull them to a session uh, we can get some of this life-saving material um, to the people that we want it to um, without having to purely rely on them being physically present. Uh, and then the last one, uh, just as a, a kind of top up, uh, if you have time between sessions, you know, some communities might go months, years, however long it is between uh, a risk education session. So we can use digital to kind of keep it top of mind. Okay, back to you again, uh, quick poll. Uh, what is the biggest barrier you have to creating a digital e or project? That could be knowledge about the platforms and the technology, unsure of the effectiveness, funding or capacity. All right, so a little bit of background on MAG's digital EOR project. Uh, this was based on a pilot uh, that we ran in Nineveh in Iraq in 2019. Uh, we then moved to a full project uh, that was initially for one year, although we've recently had it ex extended out for a second year. Uh, it is funded uh, by PMWRA, the US State Department, uh, and supported uh, through Facebook. Uh, we have a range of uh, geographical uh, and uh, explosive ordnance context, covering some legacy and new contamination, uh, rural and urban, urban areas across Iraq, Lebanon, Somalia, and Vietnam. Uh, and the, the main goals of, uh, of the first year's project was to, to deliver to 10.2 million people across those countries and establish digital risk education within each program. So whilst we're doing this, um, you know, delivering change is a key aspect of this. And then one of the challenges, you know, it's an emergent subject area at MAG and other organizations, we need to develop and formalize how this all works. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges around sort of delivering the change here. Um, so yeah, the, the project initially emerged in that pilot. Um, whether PMWRA were off, able to offer us a connection through to Facebook to get uh, ad credits to deliver the initiative, but there was no funding available to take that forward. Uh, and as a result, we uh, effectively as an organization absorbed some of those costs um, in order to cover the kind of manpower required to, to push it forward. Um, and when we started, the program itself had limited capacity or expertise and it was potentially going to be a situation where it wasn't picked up uh, and the WRA may have taken it to a, another organization. Uh, they had a particular interest in trying to reach uh, some uh, groups in Nineveh and Iraq that they were getting some public criticism for not engaging sufficiently well with and they saw this as a solution. So that explains their interest. Um, but it did actually develop uh, through um, a member of the comms team uh, at HQ at MAG, which is where I was at the time. Uh, my background is a little bit more in sort of uh, digital communication innovation. And I became aware of the project and we were able to find a nice balance between sort of my responsibilities and the program's expertise in regards to risk education. Um, but yeah, without MAG's ability to be able to absorb some of those costs, this may not have happened initially and then rolled from there. Um, another challenge was after the, the, the successful pilot, um, because it wasn't a, a recognized part of the country or the 
the international organization's strategy or part of the plan for the next year, it did stall a little bit. Um, you know, it was difficult to try and to kind of determine how we progress it forward. And uh, it actually, again, my background's a little bit of kind of uh, innovation. So I know how to write projects and stuff. So I took that off my own back uh, and then was able to secure the funding that way. Uh, but it was a, an unconventional kind of development uh, and then approach to the funding. Uh, so yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes you need to rely on advocates or individuals who are willing to kind of, you know, take things a little bit further. Um, you know, it might make some people uncomfortable in terms of going outside of established plans and strategies, um, but that's sometimes the nature of, of delivering change. Okay, quick question for you again. What technology do you expect to provide the most value uh, for digital EORE EOR in the future? Uh, so I've given some options with SMS, so text message, telephone, radio, TV, internet, social media, AR, VR. That's uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. I'll just give another few seconds for people to fill that. Uh, so the, the MAG Digital EOR project budget was was quite slim, uh, certainly smaller than many of the other um, kind of larger multi-country big donor projects that we have. Um, MAG is a $100 million a year organization. So uh, the $152,000 project from the first year and then the later nearly $100,000 project is, is quite small. Um, but we're able to make quite a big impact. But uh, a lot of that uh, is eaten up by salaries and then various consultants across website development, fans about borders, some animation, some M&E work, uh, some contributions to national staff, a little bit of travel. Uh, and then in terms of what Facebook adds uh, or provides, um, they provided us with $45,000 of advertising credits. So we don't have to spend directly on that. Uh, as well as the support of an admin agency, uh, which I don't have an exact cost for, but I estimate around sort of thirty thousand dollars. So you can see from uh, once we move into year two, the the project funding was cut a little bit, um, so we've had to change the approach slightly. We're taking on a few more things in house, but also having completed the first year of the project, we already have a number of assets and a strategy and other things that make it a little bit easier to uh, to carry on with. Um, going forward with Facebook, uh, they've provided us with $100,000 of ad credits so far. Um, they're going to enable us with uh, a content development agency as we kind of progress beyond the requirement for the admin support. Uh, and we're also working with them to try and uh, better connect with WhatsApp, uh, the reality labs, which is their virtual reality side, and then Data for Good, which is their humanitarian platform. Just a few uh, facts about Facebook. So we are driven by Facebook um, in this project uh, because that was the, the relationship and the opportunity that we've managed to secure, um, which does influence where we work and how we do things. Um, but fundamentally, it should be a case of, of using whatever technology is the most appropriate uh, for the communities that you're trying to reach. Uh, despite that, Facebook uh, does have some significant advantages. It's the, the world's uh, most popular social media platform, third most web visited website in the world, second most downloaded app. Uh, in some of the countries that we work, it's very popular. Um, and across uh, the Middle East and North Africa, it's the fastest growing region as well. Um, but more pertinently to us, um, the average Facebook user clicks on about 12 hours a month, so they can be effective in terms of uh, both getting those views and then also getting people to take action in response to them. All right, back to you again. What is the greatest benefit uh, that you think digital URE can provide? Is that to engage hard to reach groups, deliver in accessible areas, keep information top of mind, or as a complement to traditional face-to-face -face sessions. Again, I'll just linger for a few seconds while the 
everybody gets a chance to complete that. Uh, so yeah, just a quick breakdown of, of where we were working, as we said. So uh, in Iraq, uh, we worked across five governments, uh, which is four and, a half men, half, four and a half million people, so roughly about 10% of total. Uh, in Somalia, uh, we were targeting the whole country, excluding Somaliland, it's about 1.2 uh, million people actually on Facebook, so again, 10% there uh, and that was concentrated very much in kind of urban areas like Mogadishu where there's kind of new contamination uh, and was more difficult in the, the legacy kind of rural border areas but I'll discuss a little bit more about Somalia later. Um, in Lebanon we targeted the, the whole country um, so 3.8 of well whole country aged between 13 and 45 so it's just 56 percent of the total country population. Uh, and then Vietnam, a um, little bit more difficult just because uh, of um, their regional uh, mine action um, authority uh, registration in that it's not a top down. Uh, there are mine action authorities in each and every region. So it was a little bit more difficult for us to spread out. And Vietnam uh, in particular took COVID very seriously, which meant some of the resources were, were more stretched than in some other places. Just uh, some principles um, that we've tried to kind of instill across the project uh, as to try and build capacity in the programs uh, and not be reliant on people and me, but uh, enable them so that they can continue on. Um, so develop skills um, so that they can develop uh, and deliver the content, but also know the project design and uh, can carry on absent the support of the direct project. Um, We've been very fortunate to work with a number of partners um, and that helps us to maximize the opportunities, but also avoid duplication. Um, so where there's already a, a video made by somebody in the region and it ticks all our boxes and we're happy to work with them, then rather than invest funds and time to try and recreate it, we'll try and use that material uh, and make us all a little bit more efficient. Uh, being data led, um, so we, we respond to the, the, the information both that we capture through MAG and on the ground and for our surveys, but also that we capture digitally to inform what we're doing. Uh, we do everything mobile first, so mobile phone first, uh, understanding that is how most people access Facebook in the countries we were working in. And therefore there's considerations that, you know, people are using smaller screens and devices. So we need things to be clear as, as simple as possible because um, it's not as visible on a smaller screen as it is on like a laptop. Uh, we're generally working to integrate uh, DOR activity uh, into the, the regular programming uh, and move away from this, this funding, uh, which may well end after this 14 months, uh, and transition towards whatever digital vehicles are most appropriate. As I say, we're a little bit kind of Facebook led uh, at the moment, but we are moving towards uh, a more balanced uh, approach. Just some of the partners that we've worked with. Um, so in the kind of global side, um, Facebook and PMW I have mentioned, but we worked with an aid, a mobilization agency called Forward Action. Uh, we did a number of quizzes and surveys. They effectively specialize in getting people online to do things, which isn't always the easiest in a very competitive and congested social media space. Uh, I'll show you a video uh, from the engagement we did with Cairns about borders uh, a little bit later on, and then extra digital supporters uh, with the website um, in a few different places. Um, you know, we're, we're working with partners wherever appropriate to sort of extend uh, the impact that we can make. I spoke a little bit about capacity building on the principal side, but some of the things we were doing on that front include uh, we established Facebook pages uh, and websites uh, to support the delivery of all this information, but also to uh, increase uh, the, the visibility of the organization. People are more likely to trust your materials if they recognize who you are, and also to give us a little bit more of a kind of organic footprint that we can communicate uh, with people who are interested in our work without relying on their ad credit money. Um, so we did some community building as well. So uh, our pages now have more than 100,000 followers across the four of them. Um, we did a lot of training on a, on a platform called Canva. Um, that's where we made all of our graphics and a number of our videos. 
It's uh, it's an online uh, graphic design platform. Uh, there's non-profit licenses. It's it's definitely worth checking out if you're looking to try and take some of your uh, graphic materials and in-house. Various staff training from content creation, Facebook management, project design, communications techniques, uh, M&E, the, the landscape in each of the countries digitally as well, and, and moderation as well. Um, we also did a couple of uh, workshops uh, in Iraq uh, with the National Mine Action Authorities to engage them about what we're doing and we received a great response with that and we did a, a few all staff trainings with a number of guest presenters as well so as you'd expect um everything we're doing um has to be uh kind of checked uh by both our staff and also field tested uh, with the communities that we're working with um, so we did various training and discussions to kind of determine exactly what we were going to do, when and where and why and how we were going to do things. Um, we did a number of focus group discussions to establish baseline knowledge and understanding, which informed our approach. Uh, and then we had regular engagement with the National Mine Action Authorities to keep them in mind in terms of the schedules, the planned activities, the support, uh, and that authorization aspect as well. Uh, and then we integrate uh, our surveys in terms of, you know, the, the community feedback on the project into regular community days and activities so that it's not an additional separate thing, but they can do it as part of the, their regular work. Okay, one more question for you. In what region of the world do you think digital ERE has the best prospects? Is that Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, Mediterranean, Middle East, or the Americas? Okay. So just to outline uh, what we produced uh, through this past year of the project uh, across the four countries, it was a total of 168 ads that we produced. There were a few more uh, developed by the forward action team for the, the quiz, but I kept them slightly separate, uh, which comes from nearly 120 different graphics. Uh, Iraq was a particular complication in that one because they have two uh, national mine action authorities, uh, but we also had three languages, whereas the other countries were just one language. Uh, more than 55 uh, videos across all of the programs, uh, and then we had a number of quizzes and surveys in each country. And then uh, another principle that we had was that because the delivery of through Facebook is quite bite-sized, you might see one video or one graphic, whatever it is, uh, to try and keep um, a central uh, sort of one-stop shop for all of this information in one place. So wherever we pushed an ad out, there was always a, a big link to a website where they could click through and they could find all of the information in one place as well as background information about MAG, uh, in some cases reporting and things like that. Uh, you will see uh, the Somalia as a couple of extra initiatives. Um, I said um, Facebook uh, and mobile phone coverage outside uh, the capital and a couple of other kind of uh, major towns was limited. Uh, so therefore, we we took some of our content um, and delivered it through radio uh, to try and reach some of those those rural uh, and border areas. Whilst we also did some experimentations with street art uh, that included QR codes to try and kind of encourage that kind of offline online uh, connection. Um, but yeah, effectively, a, a Facebook. Uh, kind of focus project in Somalia would have basically meant that we would only touch people in urban areas. So it's very much a case of adapting um, your kind of delivery method, depending on how people use technology in the different areas. Uh, here's just a glimpse of some of the ads. So what they actually look like uh, in situ. Um, so there's a couple of videos from Iraq and Somalia, and then uh, it's actually an animation as well from, from Vietnam. Um, but yeah, that just kind of shows you what it looks like. At the bottom, you can see there's links uh, to the websites in every place. Uh, generally, we're using kind of big, clear information, um, generally trying to keep the text relatively sleek. Uh, in a rec, we have to include a few tags and some compulsory bits, which makes it a little bit longer. 
um, but trying to keep things as short, sharp uh, as possible as people have limited time. So I'm just going to show you uh, a quick basic kind of highlight reel from uh, some of our content from Iraq. So it's, uh, it's a kind of mashup of uh, various different videos and content that we produce. So uh, this may not work for everyone, depending on your, your uh, kind of bandwidth. Um, but I will include a link to the videos in the, the sort of PowerPoint presentation that we share afterwards. So uh, hopefully this works. هواي ناس ما يعرفون ان الحروب تترك وراها الغام وذخائر غير منفجرة بهواي مناطق باش ماو جنجا كان و تقامنين تقي و مينا كان برجيكي زوربون يعني لو شناني هواية ناس ما تعرف إنه النزاعات بالعراق تترك وراها ذخائر غير منفجرة بهواية مناطق. نحن مجموعة أشخاص حبينا نوصل رسالة توعوية بمساعدة منظمة ماك إم إي جي هلا حمودي وين رايح؟ هلا يوسف جاي عليه قلت اخذه ونروح للبريه المنطقه المفتوحه بقريتنا وعلاه سبقنا لي هنا لا يا حمودي ما يصير روح ليجي اماكن يمكن يكون المكان خطر بعد الحرب الاخيره كيف سأخرج؟ شكرا لك يا صديقي سأرد معروفك يوما ما أمرك شو هوا زور خوشا بدلني عيوة هي وادار مشوني شي باش بدوزينا Okay, wonderful. Uh, so yeah, here's uh, a little bit more of uh, the quiz and survey. We use this uh, as a way to try and engage people uh, with the material rather than just doing a, a kind of, you know, just delivering. We want people kind of interact and participate. And it was also a useful kind of test on the MNE side to capture some further data, these silly in terms of people's existing understandings and what they learned from the project. Uh, it's just another very quick video here. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Clowns Without Borders. Uh, it's quite a kind of, uh, you know, very short, simple, single message uh, video, but hopefully you'll, you'll get a pretty good understanding. What we're trying to do here is use a bit of fun and play and humor. Uh, the message is simply stay on the path. Um, and we're just trying to reiterate that very simple message. I can try and make it very short, fun, accessible, uh, using music that 
appeal to younger audiences. Um, so we produced 10 videos with, with fans about Buddhism in a similar kind of way. Uh, as I mentioned, everything that we produced uh, links back to a website with all of the information in one place. Uh, this is the Iraq one, so it was also in three languages, but we also include links through to our sharing links so that people can quickly share the content that they enjoy on Facebook, Viber, and WhatsApp as well. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly hand over to my colleague Christina now, uh, who will just talk you through the m and &E side of things. Hi, thanks. Um, all right. So for the m and &E for this project thus far, um, we're doing a, we did a baseline assessment. Um, currently, we're taking in data for our midterm evaluation. And then um, at the end of the second year of the project, we'll do our final evaluation. Um, so the purpose of our m and &E activities is to provide context uh, for the development and distribution of the products. Um, so this means figuring out, you know, um, how people are using Facebook, uh, whether there are differences um, in between or within communities um, of how people use Facebook and of what content they find interesting and attractive and what makes people trust information that they see online or what makes them deem information um, untrustworthy so that, uh, so that the information that's delivered through, uh, through digital means can be viewed as trustworthy and, um, and receive as much engagement as possible. Um, we also wanted to identify any barriers to access that existed within communities and then provide recommendations um, related to them. So, for example, um, you, we might be looking for issues um, uh, with access based off of gender, um, location, refugee status, um, uh, cost, economic issue, other economic issues um, to uh, so that we can provide recommendations on how to um, on how to best reach the largest percentage of the population. And we also want to see um, how uh, communities understanding of safe behaviors and their ability to identify potentially dangerous items might be changing um, over the course of, of the project and see if we can attribute those changes um, to the project to the project or to see if they might have those changes might be occurring for another reason. Um, so to that end, we developed a few different tools. Um, uh, for the baseline assessment, we had originally um, uh, developed tools to do focus group discussions um, and a quantitative household survey. Um, and, uh, and then for the midterm um, evaluation, we've also been using an online survey um, we, that we retrofitted um, for the purpose uh, from Forward Action. Um, so, um, uh, so we also trained um, MAG staff in each country to do um, to do focus group discussions, um, and um, we were planning to do the quantitative survey, but um, it wasn't possible for various other reasons. But um, we would have also done training for that as well. Um, so for these trainings, we um, we taught the staff how to plan an FGD from start to finish. We were learning about facilitation skills, um, a specific note taking technique so that we were able to uh, to code the notes more easily and to compare more easily between communities and between countries. And um, uh, and we were working together to um, to uh, make the FGD tool more applicable to each country. Um, so for the baseline assessment, we, uh, we completed FGDs in each country. Um, we did four per operational area within MAGS, uh, within MAGS areas, and we, were, and we divided our FGDs by age and gender in most, commu in most communities, um, just so that uh, people could speak openly and honestly about uh, their opinions on the topics. For the midterm evaluation, um, we wanted to uh, we wanted to measure any changes in knowledge, attitudes, and practices around EO. So we again uh, implemented FGDs um, in two of the countries, and then in countries where that was not possible because of uh, because of lack of uh, resources. Um, we used this online survey that we discussed earlier. Um, we also wanted to see if there were changes in confidence um, around EO, and, uh, and we wanted to measure the reach and, the, and engagement with, uh, with the products. Um, we also thought it was important to, um, to, to dig into how trustworthy um, community members viewed the, uh, the tools so that we could try and, um, and uh, make recommendations for the remainder of the project. So um, through these activities, we found, we've had some interesting findings. 
Um, video was seen as the clearest method of communication for these topics. Um, however, it was not necessarily viewed as the, um, as, uh, the best method in, in all countries. As because of uh, because of varying levels of access to the internet and varying levels of bandwidth, um, but for the most part, it was viewed as the clearest way of communicating, um, uh, you know, important uh, topics. So um, the barriers to access also varied um, from country to country and even within countries. Um, so um, in Iraq, there were significant barriers to access based based off of gender. Um, in Lebanon, the um, uh, the economic crisis had um, had limited access to the internet um, for large segments of the population. So we saw a lot of different reasons that people might not be able to access the information. Um, and we also found that um, that uh, communities in nearly in nearly all locations wanted additional information on both safe behaviors and identification of uh, potentially dangerous items, even in communities that had high levels of understanding around this, um, there was still there was still a perceived need for additional information for reminders and for um, and, um, you know, a resource to show to other members of, the, of their community. Um, misconceptions and myths about safe, safe behaviors and about the appearance of EO are also fairly common across, um, across most communities, but within each community there do tend to be patterns of, um, uh, of misconceptions and myths uh, that, uh, that can be addressed through the, through the ads. Um, and, uh, and the factors that affect the, trustworthy, the trustworthiness of EORE um, primarily depends on the perceived trustworthiness of the original source. So in most countries where MAG is active and where the branding is recognizable, MAG was viewed as a, um, as a trustworthy source of, uh, source of information. But, um, uh, but we also found that there were that in some countries such as Somalia, where there were other um, actors that, uh, that were more recognizable, they would be better as the, um, uh, as the face of the, um, of the project. Okay, so some of the challenges that we had on the M&E side uh, was the availability of staff to complete M&E activities. Um, you know, staff have other responsibilities, so um, that uh, you know limited how how many focus group discussions or how many observations that we were able to take. Um, there were also different levels of M&E capacity, uh, capacity uh, between country programs, and this is something that will just be built up over time. Um, permissions for movement and COVID also prevented. Um, as from necessarily doing as many observations as we would have liked, but this is an, an issue anywhere that you might that you might need to complete M&E activities. So some of the lessons that we learned through this um, was uh, the need to be flexible on the methodology to meet the program's needs and um, and to meet the programs where they're at capacity wise. Um, so uh, you know. Uh, while we would have liked to have done um, a quantitative survey in addition to our focus group discussions in, um, in multiple countries, it wasn't necessarily possible at this time. Um, and so we had to be flexible there so that we could make sure that we could still get um, high quality information uh, in the time that we had. Um, and we also did um, backup planning for our methodologies in case of unexpected issues because of COVID and because of, um, and because of you know, ongoing um, issues with, uh, with permissions in some places, we needed to, uh, we needed to be sure of, um, uh, that we had a backup plan just in case. Um, and um, we found that the that capacity building for staff was really important. It allowed us to have, um, have a similar level um, of data quality across countries, which was uh, which was very helpful um, during the analysis so that we could so that we could make more uh, more interesting comparisons, and um, and we also you know needed to develop processes for working with uh, for, for working with partners so we could um, so we could glean data from other uh, partners working on the project. Awesome, thank you, Christina. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, shuffle on as quickly as I can as we're a little bit over time. Um, so we'll get to the results. Uh, Caitlin, Savine, so I hope it's okay that I take just another five minutes to 
a couple of things off. Timing was a bit tight before the, the delayed time to start, so my apologies. Um, Robin, take your In front your of time. you, you can see uh, the digital uh, results. Um, so we had a, a target of 10.4 million across the four, four countries, uh, and we hit 16.4 million. Um, should note that the Vietnam, we did hit a technical issue with that in that our partners sent our survey to uh, the entire country uh, rather than uh, just our targeted areas. So that has inflated the number slightly. Uh, so it's close to like two and a half million. So we're in the process of extracting that. Um, but yeah, we, we came in uh, you know, quite comfortably over target. Um, every country bar Lebanon, um, exceeded the initial goal. Uh, Lebanon, we think, was down partly because of the, the economic and electricity situation, um, but also it was the one, the only one where we were targeting the entire country. And Facebook can sometimes kind of estimate a little bit over in terms of the numbers it can reach. Um, so across all of the, the ads, uh, we delivered, uh, we secured 166 million views. That's what the impressions are. Uh, and then the frequency relates to how many uh, adds each of in the individual likely to see. So in Iraq, the average user we reach would see at least five of our ads, whereas in Vietnam, it went down to about three, uh, three ads per person. Um, and you can see just in terms of the, the cost, uh, we were paying just sort of about 40 cents uh, to reach a thousand people. Uh, and then we had a 300,000 link clicks through to our websites. Um, the campaign. So we're currently in the process of writing up our, our full report that we will happily share with you in due course. Um, some of the other kind of initiatives we've been looking to outside of the project, uh, we now have an internal working group at MAG. Um, we've also created an offshoot through the, the EU or AG specifically to look at digital risk education. Uh, we're now making good progress in terms of integrating it as part of the country in the HQ strategies also working with a number of the national monetary authorities to integrate it into their strategies, uh, securing new funding uh, and doing bits of training. Uh, just a quick example case study from Vietnam. This was a gentleman called Truong Van Si. Uh, he lives in Quang Binh province. Uh, his neighbor uh, was killed in 2011 by a cluster bomb. And he saw uh, one of our adverts on his mobile phone uh, and he previously discovered uh, some uh, cluster bomb on uh, his land, but hadn't known how to report it or what to do. So he just left it. Uh, but seeing those ads prompted him uh, to contact the authorities. And a couple of days later, uh, Max teams were out there and we destroyed that land. So it's a nice kind of top and tail in terms of both uh, educating people, but then also clearing uh, devices as well. Um, just going to close off with a few kind of learnings. Uh, fundamentally, Facebook ads are easy to do. Uh, they are accessible. They are easy to set up. You can target by gender, age, location, as well as various other interests. Uh, the costs are pretty low, um, but it's it's both an effective way to reach large numbers of people or very specific groups of people. Um, but obviously, it does rely a little bit on in terms of just you know the Facebook user base, which can vary quite significantly uh, by country. Um, but if uh, Facebook uh, has those users on its platform, then the ads are, are kind of near guaranteed to be able to reach them for you. Um, retargeting allows you to kind of retarget uh, or re-engage individuals who have seen ads before. So if somebody's seen something, then you can send something back to them specifically, which creates a bit of narrative. Uh, and then also with digital platforms, will create a lot of uh, data in terms of how people are engaging with the materials. Um, just some learnings on how to maximize those opportunities. You know, if you invest in your own Facebook page to give yourself a better footprint, uh, that certainly helps. Um, keep the content as short and accessible and as digestible as possible. So we also always provide a central source of information attached to our ads. So there's always a website with everything together because often they will see bits and pieces of it where you can include calls to action. So tag a friend who might be interested in this or like comment what you know asking people to to feedback on what they said that just kind of uh, helps that organic engagement um if you can reply to those comments that cre help creates uh, a bit of learning and further opportunities as well um but content is king you know if you, you make really nice vibrant uh, effective content that is the most important aspect and then those first impressions are, are really vital 
uh, if you don't have something uh, engaging uh, and interesting to people, people will zoom past very quickly. Um, so just some challenges and some lessons learned, uh, you know, that Facebook reach in terms of our project was kind of critical in terms of what we could do or not. Uh, the capacity in each of the programs as well. So uh, in Somalia, we only had a, a one full-time staff member uh, and they actually um, were assigned to another project partway through, um, whereas our other programs were, were quite well staffed uh, and we, we certainly made more difficult and we had to do partnership working and other things to make that happen. Um, delivering change is you know, a challenge in some organizations, uh, particularly in the kind of field that we work in. Um, you know, the admin involved in starting up new projects, multi-country working is creates additional challenges. Um, and then I think that's, you know, the emergent uh, initiative, um, you know, has some renewed focus and also some mi misgivings in terms of how effective it is. Uh, and then lastly, we all know the kind of challenges that have been created through COVID. Um, some of the lessons learned, um, the value of existing materials. So a lot of the stuff we did was adapting uh, traditional uh, materials that were used in the field and, and delivering them online. Um, so where there is an established uh, program of delivering ELRE, that's a, a big advantage. Where you can identify advocates uh, in your teams who are very interested in this area of work, that certainly helps um, you know, drive things forward at a country level. Um, this project is very much scratching the, the surface of digital. Um, you know, there is a wealth of different means of communication, um, many less technologically advanced like uh, SMS, um, but also there's more advanced stuff like virtual reality. Um, there's also that kind of clash uh, between the traditional principles. Um, so in Iraq, for example, the Mine Action Authorities are very insistent that we always include all four key messages, whereas we know that in digital, trying to make things shorter and snappier and maybe focusing on one and then giving a link to the rest of it maybe works better. So there's a little bit of a clash between the old and the new. Uh, and then with any project, the, the ability to sort of build relationships is really paramount and uh, the value of collaboration. Um, mm -hmm. There have been various organizations and individuals who have play key roles in, in making all of this happen. Uh, so just where we go from here, uh, we're extended until the end of 2022. Uh, we're looking to expand coverage into a number of lo new locations, uh, and then we're expecting to exit this dedicated funding. So it's a case of trying to integrate uh, and into our mainstream programming. Um, I say we're looking to diversify that approach away from Facebook, uh, potentially include uh, small arms and light we weapons as part of a, an arm, a kind of more armed violence reduction, which would include uh, EORE as well, uh, and then doing things like this to kind of support the sector wide uh, development of the initiative. Um, so, my apologies again to, to Caitlin and the team for overrunning, um, but thank you uh, sincerely for everyone for your interest. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, for me, then I'm always happy to talk. You can see my email there. Um, and we've also uh, established uh, the Dior test team uh, and the co-chairs for that are Sebastian Kasek and Matthew Variel. So you can reach them there. So um, I will hand over to Isa, but thank you again for your time. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Christina. Uh, for your interventions. So you shared really useful information. And as we have five minutes left, uh, we can suggest that you can maybe Robin and Krishna answer questions if there are any, and then we can conclude. Yeah, very happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, hi, may I? Um, this is Laura from Fopi. Um, my question is um, whether you've, you've started thinking about how to integrate this program with other initiatives, for example, disaster preparedness initiatives or any, you know, um, any other type of um, response that is uh, provided by non-technical actors. Thank you for your question. Uh, there was an, a slide which kind of kind of covered this aspect uh, where I was going to talk about an uh, initiative that we delivered in Bata, Equatorial Guinea, um, in March of this year. 
uh, they had an explosion at a munitions store uh, that contaminated the, the local area. It was a community which hadn't been exposed to those type of issues before. There wasn't much capacity on the ground, uh, but we were able to, to rapidly develop some new materials using some photos from the ground. Uh, and then delivered that through Facebook and until around about six days. So uh, that is one of the potential advantages that requires some further exploration, uh, exploration in terms of remote uh, emergency uh, digital uh, EORE. Um, so I, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, there is another uh, question, Robin, uh, uh, on the chat. So due to internet access barriers in some locations, I suppose this is only a complementary activity to traditional ERE, correct? So yeah, that, that is the, the main way that we're looking at at the moment uh, as a complement um, to traditional activities to keep things top of mind, um, to reach some communities that we, we find harder to reach. Um, but as I say, this uh, emergency remote delivery of digital ERE does present some particular advantages. Um, certainly our donor, PMWRA, uh, the areas that they are most interested in us working in are the more difficult contexts where particularly security is a concern. Um, so it's, we expect to include Northeast Syria uh, as part of the, the next uh, and kind of 14 months of activity. Um, so, it, you know, certainly it can provide uh, a solution in terms of getting educational information uh, to some of the communities we find hard to reach, um, but we need to develop ways to effectively measure that uh, and manage it effectively. Um, but at the moment, it, it's tradition. It's it's mainly seen as a, as a value add uh, to existing activity, and that existing knowledge based and um, capacity on the ground is is really crucial to how we've been delivering things so far. Uh, hi uh, everyone. Uh, nice to be part of this meeting, and I have uh, two very practical questions, probably for Christina. The first one is, uh, what was the average duration of the video as a tool, if, if any, if you have some like one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, if any, and the, the, the first one and the second one, how did Mac count beneficiaries reached by the video, because sometimes, you know, person click the video or watches the video for one second and then just quit. So was it like only the click on the video? Was it 15 second duration, full video? How you did that? How you guys did that? Share your experience. Thank you. So uh, Raven, I think that you might know the first question better. Remind me what the first question was, sorry. Uh, the, the first average length of the video? Average, average duration of the video, if, if, if any. Uh, yeah, so we... It ranged from kind of tops two minutes, uh, but the most effective videos we had were closer between 15 and 30 seconds. Uh, and then general knowledge on this, but also proven through the project. Uh, it's those first few seconds that are really crucial. Um, people need to find it interesting and relevant and engaging to them or, you know, effectively the video audio plays, they're not very interested, they scroll on, you know. The old style of making videos, we would start with a black screen and we would fade up a logo. You do that nowadays, and there's too much going on. People are too hyperactive for that to be effective. Um, so we've we've found a new few tricks in terms of you know trying to make those first few seconds uh, as engaging as possible. And then in terms of the M and E and how we're going to count uh, video views, this is based on somewhat uh, in terms of how Facebook ads are, are more generally considered. Um, but we, I think it's two thirds uh, watch of the videos that we would count as a, a video view. Um, but that's another aspect of something that we are trying to kind of further and develop as various organizations work 
uh, on this approach, uh, we want to standardize how we each all record things. So if we say that, you know, we had 100,000 views of our video and another organization says we have 50, but we know that we're effectively saying the same thing. Um, because as you say, you know, a video just being opened and viewed for one second effectively isn't really of any value. So uh, we will be, we will share all of our kind of methodology criteria around this and then work across the sector to try and establish a more cons consistent framework so you can see what we've done and it may not be perfect and there may be some kind of iterations across as we go um but yeah that's the the mark that we're currently using yeah it's, uh, the, your report is really i'm looking forward to get it and that would be really appreciated so we need to standardize our approaches i think thank you so much Okay, um, thank you, Robin and Krishna, for uh, this uh, inspiring webinar. I saw that there were questions in the chat box, so we will include these responses in the summary email uh, with the recording. Uh, so the recording and the email we will share it at a later date. Uh, I will. Thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, there is no webinar in December. The next webinar will be in January. So I will wish you a happy end of the year and see you in 2022.